The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you The Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. Join Martin as he conducts regular Q&A sessions on topics of interest to Christians serious about their faith. These Q&A sessions will continue to cover an ever-widening range of topics, all with an eye to honoring the command to let all things be done unto edification. Hello, this is Martin Sobretti, Vice President of Calcedon, going live right now with a little Q&A session for the friends, supporters, and associates of Calcedon. Uh, we're just getting started a little early, possibly, because what they don't tell you with the software is that uh, you can't see the time on an iPhone uh, when it's operating. So I'm going on on faith that uh, there'll be some folks joining us. Um, Mark did an excellent job doing a uh, exposition of this passage of the Matthew 7. And of course, only Jesus can speak as one having authority. Uh, best we can do is uh, <laughs> best we can do is to uh, speak as if those are sitting in uh, Moses' seat and uh, being faithful with the scriptures. So once we have some Q's lighten up, we'll have some A's forthcoming on my part. And uh, I see some of us, some folks have already joined us. And uh, that's exciting to us because this is the first time we're going ahead and doing this kind of thing. Uh, it was brought to our attention, and of course I knew this historically, that uh, after R.J. Rashtuni completed a sermon, a message, uh, you would notice on all the tapes that there were questions called for. Are there any questions on our lesson? He would ask, and uh, the questions would range far and wide, uh, sometimes having very little to do with the topic of the message, and he tended to accommodate them anyway. So, uh, but we don't do that at the current time, and that's going to change effective today. And if this is successful, if there are those who get benefit from this, and they find it edifying, then we'll proceed and uh, continue this process uh, so long as God gives us strength to uh, answer the questions that are posed to us. Uh, again, we're not infallible, we're not inerrant, and, uh, but we do everything as scripturally as we possibly can. And um, well, We have a question that has just come on in. Uh, do you think the people of Jesus' day realized the Pharisees were his target of criticism? I believe the Pharisees felt that was a problem, uh, they made a point saying the whole world is running after this guy, and that meant that they were not following after the Pharisees' teaching. It probably comforted them somewhat when Jesus said, hey, they sit in the, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, therefore whatsoever they tell you to do, do it. But then comes the clincher, uh, but don't do as they do, because they say and do not. And to be clear, to sit in Moses' seat means to uh, recite and apply properly the law of Moses. Uh, the covenants and testimonies that came beforehand. And they saw this distinction not only in how Jesus did it, but also that uh, uh, they saw the reaction of the Pharisees to it. Because uh, oftentimes we read in Scripture that the Pharisees perceived that he spoke against them. And I don't think the average uh, the person was not attuned to this possibility. If it only was the Pharisees that were bothered by it, uh, they probably wouldn't have been so bothered, but they knew that the entire world was going after this fellow, and that only happened because uh, they were not listening to the Pharisees, who had very little positive to say about Jesus at all. We'll note that when... See now, yeah, Nicodemus, I believe it was, approached the, uh, the Pharisees in John 7 uh, about the charges and stuff like that. Uh, one of the interesting points made by the Pharisees is they say, as for this rabble, as for this mob, cursed are they because they're following Jesus. So, yeah, I'd say that if you, you're going to follow where the leadership is, and they didn't see leadership in the Pharisees anymore at this point. They saw that the promises made to Israel by Jehovah through the prophets from Moses forward, actually from Genesis on to Zechariah, in Malachi, Jesus was the one steering those things in the right direction. 
Follow-up question. Today, people sling the term Pharisee to anyone they disagree with. What does this indicate to you? Uh, well, it can mean several things. The person could literally be uh, seated in the seat of a Pharisee, can act Pharisaical. And that means that externalism in religion is the dominant factor in that woman or man's approach to things, particularly criticism of others. So when you say you are a Pharisee, uh, that indicates it's a uh, valued judgment. Uh, it is a condemnation of sorts nowadays. It's ironic that at the time, Pharisees were kind of holding the line on orthodoxy, and that's clear because of their contrast, their different position with respect to the Sadducees on things like the resurrection and other critical matters. The Pharisees were on the right side of this matter. So when Jesus shut the Sadducee contingent down uh, with a very clever juxtaposition of scriptures, to prove that there's a resurrection from the dead, contra the Sadducees, the Pharisees were very pleased. They said, well, he spoke well on this point. So the Pharisees at some times uh, had orthodox positions. But what had happened, of course, is that a big hedge had been applied around the Torah. And it's this hedge that they started to defend. It's any time that you are defending something beyond what Scripture says, you've turned into a Pharisee. And therefore... Today, there's a dispute as to how much of the scripture is applicable in the New Testament era. And people have different answers to that question. Chalcedon has a relatively broad understanding of how much of the Old Testament uh, is still applicable. And consequently, people will say, you're a Pharisee because you're applying more than ought to be applied in the New Covenant era. What we need then to do is to go to the scripture and say, is that a correct assessment? Are we being rightly or wrongly uh, saddled with this name Pharisee? particularly in a pejorative or negative sense. So that's what has to happen. We need to actually unpack that. Because to make that charge is very premature. You actually have, in fact, what it becomes is a, a slur, a shorthand way to, to discredit someone without actually having reasoned that they are truly a Pharisee. You have to actually go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And a lot of people today are unwilling to go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to look at the actual scriptures that apply. They've already made their mind up. Uh, pretty much as the Pharisees, ironically, in the past had uh, on Jesus. So closed minds are not going to get us there. It, we need to be open to the scripture. We need to be constantly reforming. That needs to be more than just a s empty slogan that has no meat behind it. Uh, it has to uh, be reflected in uh, our actions and our conduct and our speech. And that's not happening. But again, like I said, the, the fundamental point is that the term is used to shut down discussion. You're just a Pharisee. Uh, usually that's associated with a, a legalist. You, you teach legalism, therefore you're a Pharisee. And, uh, and that doesn't get us anywhere near the question, why do you believe this? Is this truly the right definition of legalism? Or are you deciding uh, that you're going to use this as an ad hominem attack? Jesus never told someone, hey, you're a Pharisee, therefore you're bad. He actually looked at the fruit. By their fruits ye shall know them. And he also would uh, probably agree very strongly with Isaiah's position to the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to these, it's because there's no light in them. Therefore, if someone speaks not according to the law and the testimony, either by subtracting or adding to it, then we have a problem. Then there is darkness, and the Pharisees were criticized for the darkness uh, that they uh, essentially entered into the equation for Israel's walk becoming blind guides, in effect, and then guiding, in turn, the people into a ditch with themselves. And this is the problem with all Phariseeism, again, is adding to Scripture. So what has to happen for, say, uh, Chalcedon to be successfully charged with Phariseeism is we would need to say uh, our official positions uh, exceed that of Scripture or subtract from Scripture. But where is that toe-to-toe -to -toe discussion? Where have we have had that kind of thing, and we have not. Therefore, it's my view that it's actually very uh, premature to say, hey, uh, Phariseeism uh, uh, prevails among these Reconstructionists. I have another question. Could you comment on the relationship between harmony among brothers in Christ and the stance for orthodoxy? That is a, uh, an interesting one. Dr. Lorraine Bettner, who I knew uh, personally, uh, made a quotation, and it wasn't original with him. I know it uh, probably was something that had arisen a lot, lot earlier. Uh, he said, in, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. So the point is, what are the essentials that we have to have unity on? 
what are the non-essentials that we can have liberty on. Um, and then the third point, most people miss this too, is the charitable thing regardless of the other points. Are we to be anything less than um, gentle as lambs, gentle as doves, if you will, in our approach to others? Sure, wise as serpents, but also gentle as doves. And we don't see that much gentleness uh, in a lot of the open discussion these days. So there cannot be peace at any price because that peace is then being purchased with something you don't have to, to sell, which is the deposit that would cost so dearly for us to have, which is the scriptures, right? Timothy was charged by Paul that we have this sacred deposit given to you and you are to protect it with all you have and unto death. It was that important. So some things are worth dying for, and the scripture is a hill worth dying on, and it's, it's, it's that simple. And I take that both metaphorically and perhaps even uh, um, literally, that that's the thing that's worth dying for. Certainly martyrdom in the first centuries was not unknown for exactly this point. They were not going to deny, deny the Lord Jesus Christ or the scriptures that... Uh, um, were vouchsafed to us to record you know, his work from beginning to end. So, uh, Daldus now begins, what, is, what does it mean to have um, peace with brothers? Brothers can certainly differ very strongly on things, but they can be disagree in an agreeable way. That's the whole notion of iron sharpening iron. But in the modern Facebook world, in the post-Trump era, if you want to call it that, all this discourse has become coarsened to the point where it simply uh, is splinters and sparks flying. Uh, part of the problem is we don't communicate in person, where all the inflections, the facial expressions indicate maybe humor or earnestness or tongue-in-cheek is being applied or a nuance that is not obvious in a very short sentence. That's why I think trying to communicate via tweets uh, in 140 characters is insane. You can, uh, it was wisely said, all you can do is make assertion, assertions. You cannot raise an argument or um, have a, a dialogue properly with the shortened format, with all these sound bites. Sound bites are the curse of theology. Sound bite theology is not going to get you very far. Plenty of assertions, and when someone contradicts the assertion, they might have good biblical reason, but what you're going to do in turn is attack them directly. You're a moron. You're an idiot. You're not in my league to talk about this. So this kind of discourse is dishonoring to Christ. And we never actually get to the core of the subject because we're back in the ad hominem era. area. Why? Because we've lost communication because it is now uh, reduced to these little short sentences and squibs uh, one has to be very cautious even in replying in detail in a Facebook uh, thread. Uh, it can be misunderstood. Uh, the worst possible constructions are put upon these things. Uh, when John Frame wrote his uh, little book on the knowledge of the doctrine of God, he made a point that we're not supposed to put the most der uh, derogatory construction on someone else's comment. We should try to put the most positive spin on it. In other words, be charitable to them and gracious. And if grace is not prevailing in our discussions, then if we do in fact have the right message of God, let's assume on the for sake of argument, Chalcedon is correct on a lot of these points that it raises, uh, what good is it if we're alienating everybody in the process of trying to communicate it because we're obnoxious and arrogant, uh, which uh, exudes pride? That has to stop. If it continues, then we're simply going to bury ourselves and God's going to use someone else who is... Uh, broken to harness, if you will, meek. God will use the meek in the world and not the proud and arrogant to propagate the truth. The truth does not depend on our being obnoxious to propagate it and to, to be forceful. The truth can be forceful without being ugly. In fact, in my view, the truth is actually a, a beautiful thing. Uh, and therefore, if we are uh, entrusted with it, we should then be careful about how we go about handling it. Another question. Too often today the pendulum swings from one extreme to another, so we go from one page from patriarchy to feminism. How may theonomists help produce a godly view of men and women in Christ? I think that's an interesting point. There's two aspects here, the swinging of, of the pendulum, and why, the, why does this happen? Because we have an action-reaction effect. Mark even referred to cause and effect in his message earlier today. We have a cause and effect. So someone asserts A, and maybe they 
over a certain A. And in response to that, B pops up. And B goes too far in the opposite direction to correct for the excessive or exaggerations of A. Still, this pendulum is not at biblical center. Uh, now, let's say this. By asserting B, the person who swung the pendulum back but too far actually had served the kingdom of God in at least getting this pendulum moving off of A, which might have been far farther away from the biblical center point than it was before. So in a process, we should eventually, uh, through iterations, if you will, uh, arrive at the center. Now, a theological change does not happen quickly. Bettner pointed out that these changes take centuries. And so if you're impatient, uh, you're going to be very distressed. The last person who should be impatient is a post-millennialist. Uh, in their view, the sands of time have not run out, and there are plenty of time for God to do many zillions of things yet to, uh, in terms of moving his kingdom forward on his timetable and according to his prerogatives and uh, to fill, fulfill his purposes. So the mere fact that this pendulum is swinging, we're sad that it swings away from this correct point, but it does so in the interest of finally arriving back, and that's what we have. For example, uh, Jesus did a very good job of re-swinging the pendulum. We talked earlier in this discussion about the hedge that was set around the Torah. If the Torah had said, the law of God had said, don't go within uh, 10 feet of X, then the hedge would be, let's not do the 10 foot, let's do 30 foot. Now, God didn't say anything about 30 feet. It's nowhere in there. It's 10 foot, say. Uh, but they say, we'll put this hedge, a protective hedge. If you don't go with 30, you're never going to get to the 10. So they added to scripture in the interest of uh, safety. But nonetheless, that is Phariseeism, as we talked about before, and it is corrupting scripture because now it has to set a new standard and everyone's now accountable for the new standard. So what Jesus did, of course, in Matthew 5, in the passage that uh, Mark had been discussing, is to clean house on all that junk and swing the pendulum right back to dead center. And he intensified the law of God, which had become externalized in the teaching of the Pharisees, uh, and had not gone to the heart of the matter, which was man's rebellion against God and man's need to uh, submit his will to his maker and his creator and his savior. So the pendulum swinging is not necessarily a bad thing, and it's going to continue to swing until the promise of Zechariah 14 occurs. It's that in that day shall the Lord be one, and his name be one. In other words, there'll be only one Lord and only one name for him. And in other words, there'll be a unity of understanding of who God is and what he expects of us. Isaiah puts it this way, that one day uh, Zion shall see eye to eye. That day is not today. So the pendulum's going to swing. So our obligation is to continue to pull on the pendulum toward the perceived center. And that's because and you get to that with strong biblical scholarship. Dig, dig, dig. Don't throw out the last five or six centuries of work in these areas. Sometimes what happens is that there's a historical sweep where a, uh, something gets entrenched and really is a tradition of man and not part of the law of God, but it's so entrenched it now functions as if it was God's law, what God expects. So people say it's a sin to violate X, and consequently X now has new authority that it didn't have when the scripture was written. And we have a problem at that point. And without resolving that, we're going to continue to accumulate things over time. The, the uh, Pharisees are the result of an accumulation of erroneous approaches to Scripture. Uh, we had a big cleaning of house in the Reformation. We are due for many more because in our interactions with humanism in particularly, uh, particular, we have compromised constantly. And that has to stop also. So what about the, the relationship of patriarchy to feminism? What is the proper balance? Has the church arrived at a universal conclusion here? No, it's spread all over the map. So what we have to then do is to be clear in what the scripture is teaching. And some of this is still under some study and dispute. Uh, and, and we can see it openly where, where it's being pursued in uh, various Facebook threads which do not, again, bring out the best. Even if I was inclined to agree with, say, position A, uh, I might be aghast at how position A is being promoted, one, and then two, uh, very harsh negative reactions to position A, even if I'm sympathetic to it as having a stronger scriptural basis, say, than uh, position B or C or D. And, and 
what happens now is open condemnation of the other position first. If you don't hold to my view on this, uh, you're worthy of being condemned. You are either um, believe in some kind of promiscuous feminism, or you've introduced these demonic things into the scriptures, or conversely on the other side, all you're interested in is doing is protecting uh, men who abuse their wives. And so we have these two poles, and the truth is, like you say, in the question implies somewhere in the center where we maximize liberty and freedom for all, husband and wife, male and female. All the promises of Scripture need to come together in this area too. So I can assure you that one time in the future we will have the promise fulfilled that Zion shall see eye to eye, even on the question of patriarchy versus feminism. Uh, but it's not a matter of snapping the fingers or Chalcedon produces a position paper and boom, it's fixed. What the position paper will do is stir the pot, and uh, which is important, and it'll also hopefully bring more light to, to bear than heat on that particular topic because it, it rages today. It rages because uh, both p p sides, I think, are pulling um, to protect something. And one of the sides, and, and each of them may have something worthy of protection, uh, but the way that they're going about it and how much they're protecting, that's the thing that needs to be looked at and uh, with a very careful scriptural eye and perhaps even dispassionately. I have to remember, if you're going to rule for the Lord, you cannot be afraid of the face of man or woman. And uh, and currently we are. I think they're not Chalcedon specifically, but in general, the church is concerned about what the pastor is going to say, what this contingent, what this group over here is going to say. If I say X, Y, and Z, there's going to be blowback and fallout from it. So you have to be fearless in presenting the scriptural view, knowing that even if it's not accepted this year, if it's the truth, it will out. We will come to that fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 14. In that day, shall the Lord be one and his name be one, and that unity of vision will prevail. That means that currently we will operate in a level of darkness. So if we don't have doctrinal unity today, we better have some kind of organic unity because Christ is looking for that. That's the sense in which we are to be called to be one and to overlook the differences so long as they are not in the essentials and to work together to um, arrive at the proper solutions to these problems and make sure that we're not in fact inflicting uh, evil on our uh, sisters in the process. Next question, do you think these Facebook dialogues reflect how few deep conversations happen in most church circles? <laughs> I'll say one thing for Facebook dialogue, they show that there's some di some discussion going on because some churches are pretty much mum and are in lockstep with their pastors um, because they let the pastors do their thinking for them. And I think uh, Jesus raises a big red flag uh, in regard to this. Uh, he uh, calls the, you know, the, the folks, the, the people had been seeing him heal the blind and uh, lame walk and things in this order and they want to go around the Pharisees and ask, hey, is this guy the Messiah or not? <clears throat> Jesus calls them hypocrites. He says, you know, you look at the signs of the sky and you can say it's red and it's going to be a storm in the morning or good weather. He says, but you can't discern the signs of the times. He basically saying, God equipped you to make this decision for yourself, to think for yourself. God created a mind in you folks and you have the apparatus, you have everything necessary to decide for yourself without having the Pharisees think for you whether I am the Messiah or not. So there is a sense in which God has uh, reposed in man the ability to think for oneself and not follow a blind guide into the ditch, which can happen. In fact, this is kind of what marked early America, right? In early America, the sermons were extremely long, you know, three, four, five hours in cold churches without air, AC or heating or uh, cushions on the seats. And uh, if the pastor should say a thing amiss, people would shoot right up in the pews and say, that's incorrect, pastor. They would correct the pastor. And that would be almost unheard of these days in most churches for the uh, for two reasons. One, be unheard of that the laity was as well trained and studied in scripture as the pastor and that they would have the nerve to stand up and correct him. <coughs> Excuse me a sec. I seem to be going non-stop today. 
So what is a deep conversation anyway? Uh, <clears throat> deep means that we, we're, we're going back and forth, back and forth, plumbing the depths of something. And uh, studying the depths of what's on the treasures of Christ, in this effect. And that means that the scriptures, of course, have and, and um, possess this property, that they're extremely deep in, in many senses uh, because of the author of them, beyond our understanding, or very difficult to understand. The book of Hebrews says, I have many things to uh, say unto you and difficult to understand. So uh, that means, and why? Because it says, You are slothful in hearing. Uh, I've written about this in the article, The Perpetual Kindergarten, that's on the Chalcedon website. That word, nuthroi, meaning slothful, <laughs> uh, is a very peculiar word. It only occurs twice in the book of Hebrews, in chapter uh, 6 as well as 5. And it should be noteworthy that to be slothful in hearing is a moral judgment. Remember what Christ says in Matthew 25, Oh, you wicked and slothful servant. It's a problem to be slothful when you approach the Word of God. We are supposed to be <clears throat> workmen approved, not ashamed. So we would have depth of discussion if, in fact, the pastors were expecting the uh, flock to study the Word. But what happens is that everything gets babied down to the lowest common denominator, and we're not raising up a laity that's strongly equipped in the Word of God. That's one reason that parachurch ministries have started to pop up to try to uh, backfill this hole in what the churches are doing. If the churches were doing everything that God has called them to do, and we're not just feeding the lambs but the sheep, because they're called to do both, not just the lambs, not just perpetual kindergarten, but raising people all the way up to the difficult matters that, in fact, the book of Hebrews gets into right after it says, you know, I don't know if you're ready for it, but we're going to talk about Melchizedek anyway for three more chapters. Uh, if the churches aren't going to do that, then the parachurch ministries are going to have to pop up. I've said it many times, even at the public meetings for Chalcedon back as early as 2008, I said, my job is to make Chalcedon obsolete. Uh, we should not have the parachurch ministries. They only exist because the church is not doing the job. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we have some all sorts of interesting personal questions here. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to... <laughs> Well, we didn't expect that technical glitch. Let's see if I can back up the questions. Sabuiso <laughs> uh, Roberts wants to know if we can uh, um, let they let to get the books, and also I have a newlywed. What advice can you give for us, successful as a young couple? I think both of you have to be sold out on the scriptures um, and the whole counsel of God. I think if you're going to be involved in that. That would be a fantastic thing. I see you're obviously on Facebook, therefore most of the books are available for free online and can be read there. Uh, so I would certainly go there and um, you can certainly message me privately about any other matters. Now what was that other wonderful thing that just popped up? Okay, so that's a personal thing having to do with um, Bajadar Marinov. So according to the senior pastor at Kings in Texas, he claims that Marinov rejects all authority. My question is, Mr. Marinov, is Mr. Marinov going to be allowed to write for the foundation since you are speaking of elitism? Um, that's an interesting point. So there's two points here. Uh, and of course, the, the Proverbs are very clear too here. Uh, like a man who seizes a passing dog by the ears is he who meddles in a quarrel not his own. So I think that is Pastor Ron Smith who made that assessment. And I think all authority is a pretty interesting uh, claim. Uh, it's certainly evident that ecclesiastical authority in particular cases here has been rejected by Mr. Marinov, who may or may not have been the center of those things. So I think you're um, putting that question first in the interest to see, and I'm setting up my other question. If this is a man who has rejects all authority, is he going to be allowed to write for the foundation? Since I'm speaking of elitism, and I guess by elitism we're saying that he regards himself as, or Mr. Marinov regards himself as beyond the scope of all authority. Well, whether he regards himself as beyond that or not, um, it simply is not true. Certainly he's known as beyond the stretch of God's authority. 
and therefore uh, he can be reached through direct communication, brother to brother, and he can be prayed for if one has a dispute with him. And moreover, due process has to be followed. And I think this is a problem because people have come to Chalcedon before in the past and said, are you not going to censure so-and-so or, or, or act as some kind of judge? Which Chalcedon is not, by the way, a, any kind of judge or jury. We are a Christian educational foundation. But I uh, said, all right, tell you what, get me official charges with witnesses so I have something to do with due process. Were any forthcoming? Did I ever get any responses in this regard? No. And when a charge actually was, someone presented uh, particular witnesses, I then called the witnesses on the phone, and the story was very radically different that the witnesses provided me. So I can only go by what I have. I cannot go by someone else's um, dislike for, for Mr. Marinov and his views. And his views had to be perhaps sorted out from his personal approach to things. Um, particularly in respect to the fact that in Bulgaria, whether we like it or not, theology is a contact sport, and we uh, would be very much surprised to uh, find the kind of wording that goes back and forth in a discussion. Uh, it's, it's, it can be very off-putting uh, to Americans, and that whether that means we're soft or he's too hard, uh, the fact is it's a clash. That clash, nonetheless, is very real. And so, in, in this particular case, uh, we have to deal with, with, with that question, too. And some people overlook it, and other people do not. And uh, so we have here someone who obviously is very intelligent and talented, and who manages to burn bridges, uh, in my view, unnecessarily. Now, in his view, he, those are bridges worth, worth burning. Uh, and so it's a complicated thing, because he does not work for us. He has not written for us for many, uh, at least, I think, three or four years at this point. And uh, I would like to recapture all serious uh, warriors for Christ uh, to, do, to move ahead in the same positive direction. And that's why I don't want to burn the bridge, even though most folks have. Folks have. And the other thing interesting about Mr. Marinoff is that, he, and you have to take this uh, with a grain of salt when I say it, is that sometimes he manages to alienate constituencies that we would not be friendly with. I know that the, the kinists wanted to particularly to have him uh, rail, you know, run out of town on a rail and for Kelsey to be a part of that process. Are you not going to uh, attack this fellow right away on our behalf? And so that's where the witnesses didn't come forward. And if they don't come forward, we don't have due justice, uh, due process. If we don't have due process, we don't have justice. And what Chalcedon stands for is justice, justice, shalt thou do. That's what we were told very explicitly in Deuteronomy. That's our obligation, and therefore I cannot proceed with something judicial without judicial witnesses in my hands. Now, if folks who are posing these questions want to pass these witnesses to me, uh, then we can talk. But in the absence of witnesses and merely a notion, uh, a message from his former pastor, uh, who I do respect, I should point out to, uh, it's not adequate to do anything with, uh, apart from the fact that we have not published anything of his for quite a few years. And uh, if I were to publish something of his, it'd probably involve a disclaimer. It'd have to be a very important topic where he had something to say that no one else had it, and the kingdom of God had to hear it, regardless of how uh, much he burns his bridges elsewhere. And uh, that's that's the way it's going to have to be. I don't think those who've mentored him have done as good a job as they could have. Uh, they might have directed him very well in a lot of areas, uh, particularly in the depth of scholarship. But in how he approaches the rest of Christendom, um, he has created conflict that is not clear to me was necessary, and certainly uh, it's a very open question whether it's been edifying to anybody, because what we're not talking we're not talking about anything other than Bajadar's added again that kind of statement. I hear it and I say, but you, no one's reading what he wrote. Uh, that needs to be dealt with specifically, because even if you're successful in shutting him down, his writings are going to last. They will persist into time. You won't be able to censure them. And someone's going to get their hands on him. If he is anywhere near scriptural truth, it's going to still pop out. 
So uh, it's a complicated question. It's not a simple matter of uh, until the church actually acts uh, against him uh, with full just charges, then we can do this. I kind of am saddened that we have to focus our very first Q&A on something so personal as what are you, is Cal Sweden going to do about person X? That means that we're not talking about the kingdom anymore. We're talking about uh, something very, very different, where there's an emotional component that is going to cloud people's judgment and assessment. And uh, that's a dangerous thing, because then we're going to have, uh, if, I, if, if we go any farther without those witnesses and without justice being done, that means, let's assume that I was foolish enough to actually answer this straight up. Then there's going to be some other person next week well, what about so-and-so who said this, and this seminarian said that? And now I have to have a giant blacklist prepared, and I might as well just post that, and that's Chalcedon's entire website. It's not building the kingdom of God, but pointing out everyone who's uh, uh, allegedly uh, tearing it down because they don't uh, total line with a doctrinal position A, B, or C. And that is not Chalcedon's position. You know, those who shall be of thee shall build, Isaiah 58, 12 informs us, and to the extent that we diverted this Q&A to that question, I've not spent time building. I've spent time uh, trying to point out a huge problem in how we interact with each other personally. Does Mr. Marinoff uh, incite this problem? No doubt in many cases he does. The response to him, is it always the fair, just, balanced response? Not always. It's often in kind. And so therefore, instead of being as gentle as doves, uh, we have everyone being... Uh, very vicious, and soon as Paul Born will consume each other as we backbite each other till there's nothing left. So let's see if there's a more positive question after that. Sorry for my finger being up there. Don't think there is any substance, is there? I don't want to crash, crash this down. Ah, here we go. I appreciate your firm stand and loving heart for God's glory. I also deeply appreciate the use of your brain for the furtherance of God's kingdom. I admire your deeply biblically informed thinking analyses in, and it goes dot, dot, dot. I'm not sure how we're going to get that. Are you interested in Christian education? Would you like to learn how to be a Christian teacher or how to run your very own Christian school with success? The GCS Apprenticeship Program can help. Learn more on our website at gcsapprenticeship.com. Ah, yes, I want to talk about kinism. Good afternoon, Martin. You mentioned kinism. As you know, kinism is a very rapidly growing school of thought today. I think it's fair to say that many kinists believe that R.J. Rashtuni was in fact a proto, I guess the next word would be kinist, because I can't see the rest of it. Uh, so you think it's fair, and this is a free country, and you have liberty to believe whatever you want about R.J. Rashtuni. I can tell you this, when there was a very extended discussion on this very point with quotations coming back left and right from the book Politics of Guilt and Pity, that I kept pulling the context that was being excised and extracted and removed and suppressed by the kinist who was putting them forward. And so we didn't get a fair assessment of Russia's position. He's a proto-kinist when you slice them up and dice them up and then you get kinism out at the back end of the process. But you made sausage out of Dr. Rashtuni in the process. And so I very patiently went through that process with this particular kinist. And by the time he realized that he had been proven wrong, did he acknowledge error, that he had misappropriated uh, Dr. Rashtuni's work for himself? No. What he did was attack Chalcedon. He says, well, now that's the end of Chalcedon because you're taking the wrong position. No acknowledgment that he had failed in his mission to force Dr. Rashtuni into his camp, just bitterness and anger and vitriol at the table, which was never introduced by me in the process. I was extremely patient, and those who were observing this debate, which I believe was on a spiritual sounding board, if I'm not mistaken, who those who uh, one of those two sites that was uh, involving folks involved in abuse, uh, at, the, at that point in time, they said, wow, you handled it very smoothly and carefully and patiently. He's the one who finally went off at the deep end. Why is that? Because ultimately there's an emotional commitment to these positions, and that dominates the entire picture. I'm sorry to hear that some folks are getting some buffering 
In other words, this video could be choppy. I can assure you that on our end, we have a gigabit per second going on. So it must be somewhere between here and there. See if there's any other questions. And make sure I don't drop the camera at this time. That's the last question that we have. So, if there aren't any other questions, I'll hold for another minute or two on uh, some of these points. Here's your chance to ask questions of Chalcedon. At least one of the Chalcedon principles. I'm going to go back to Becky Moorcraft's and see if there's a way to get the whole quotation. It just seems that it's too long. It just um, She was setting up for a question and the full question didn't come in. Ah, there was a question on the tithe, okay. Okay, read more does get me a little bit more and then we get to the quotations. Okay, Andrea, there was a good question on the tithe. All right, Andrea, do you know what the question on the tithe was and who asked it? I was still looking for it. Ongoing online, okay. Well, I don't see those things that are happening online. I agree with Robert uh, Roberto Corral Jr. He provided a blueprint for taking the down the state. Now, taking down the state to its proper size, I think, is a more fair assessment. Uh, I think Dr. Fugate's work in respect to the uh, poll tax and defense of Dr. Rushton's position on that is significant because if that position is correct, and I've publicly defended it in uh, PowerPoint presentations across the country. Uh, it means that the federal government and the state governments and the city governments have about uh, almost 11,000 times more money than the Bible allows them to have. So you'd have a massive shrinking of the state. Not quite anarchism, but an extreme form of minarchism. And it worked for Israel and can work for us today if self Christian self-government, obviously, uh, comes in to fill the gap. However, when self-government is deficient and is on the wane, then the state comes in to fill that gap. There's always going to be a power gap. There's always going to be the situation where nature abhors a vacuum, if you will. And in this instance, it's the vacuum of government, and if self-government in particular. And when self-government is on the wane, we are in uh, trouble. <coughs> okay, we have a good question here. What is Chalcedon's position on the tithe? We hold, uh, in general... <laughs> i got to explain this back again. And uh, there's a question about the essentials. And we're in before that. And of course, I do agree, Foundations of Found, uh, Social Order is one of the great books. Kelsey's position on the tithe is that all the tithes are still operative, but also that the uh, ordinances concerning them apply too. And this raises the question of where does the tithe go? There's actually three tithes plus a poll tax. The poll tax governs and, and pays for the civil government. It's half a shekel of uh, silver for a male head of household 20 years old and up. And that's for your civil government. In turn, the tithe is to go to the Levites. Uh, Levitical or social tithe, if you want to call it that. Then you have a rejoicing tithe and finally the poor tithe, which eradicates poverty. I'm big on that poor tithe concept because we've recorded in the book of Maccabees that when uh, the Israelis came back from the Babylonian exile, uh, they were very conscious of the fact that they had violated these the poor tithe rules. And so they enforced them. And they were so good at it that they had an immense amount of surplus sitting at the temple treasury in Jerusalem, which was recorded in the book of Maccabees. And you can't have a surplus unless you've already taken care of all your poverty. In other words, they had effectively lifted everyone out of poverty by around 177 uh, BC. They was, there was no poor people to give the poor tithe to. And then, uh, in principles based on the book of Numbers, they then had to take the uh, excess and give it to the, uh, the priests at the temple to hold over for, say, a rainy day. Otherwise, it had to go directly to the poor because there was no middlemen otherwise 
for the poor tithe. There was an eye-to-eye transaction which improved community, too, in the, in the process. It lifted people meaningfully out of poverty. So the poor tithe was a very important part of, this, of, the, of the tithe. And it's my view that in uh, Mark 10, uh, Jesus actually condemns the rich young ruler for violating the poor tithe. Because when he lists all the commandments that were being broken, that, that were to be kept by this man, uh, he mentions one that's not in the Ten Commandments. He says, thou shalt not defraud, the Greek word epistoresis. He says, and that is a term, technical term used for depriving someone of the poor tithe. And when the guy says, I've done all these things, Jesus says, no, one of these you lack. You have to go sell everything you have and give to the poor, in essence, and then follow me. You have to straighten out the fact that you have an arrears with the poor. You have not paid the poor tithe. You've defrauded them of this. And that's one reason, I think, why we see the um, widow with the two mites. Why is she in such stark poverty when just uh, 200 years, bef- 180 years before, poverty had been eradicated because Israel, again, was resting on its lees and not observing these laws and rules. So the poor tithe has meaning, and it actually is referred to, uh, apparently in this passage in Mark 10, as a, a serious matter. And Isaiah called it serious because to fail to pay it is to grind the faces of the poor, and God then takes up the cause of the poor against the nation that refuses to do it. Sure, there are no sanctions uh, in civil government for failing to pay, to pay. God is the jurisdiction for it, and that's pretty serious business when he wipes you out for failing to pay it. The big dispute and conflict uh, about the tithing is where does that big social tithe go, the first 10%? And in our view is that the passage in uh, Numbers 18, I think it's 36, and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, and Nehemiah 10.38, if I'm not mistaken, those passages say that the tithe goes to the Levites, and the Levites tithe a tithe of it, 10% of 10%, to the priests. So basically the tithe is sliced into 90% for Levites and then 10% for institutional worship. The Levites were an entire tribe spread throughout all Israel responsible for education and health matters and uh, instructing the uh, nation what to do. You shall seek knowledge at the lip of the Levite. This is one of the condemnations made of them by Malachi that they weren't doing their job. Uh, Even the Levites had fallen down. So the question is, what should happen to the tithe today? I believe the same thing, and Calcine and Dr. Rashtuni has, and Mark Rashtuni have talked about the same thing. It should be divided the way the Bible talks about. Whoever is functioning a Levitical function gets the 10, 90% of the tithe, and the other 10% goes to institutional worship. This does not play well with most churches, which, one, are not even getting the tithe in the first place, even though they ask for it. In our view, they should not ask for the entire tithe unless they are running a whole Christian school, for example. Uh, Then we can talk. At that point, education uh, is working. But if you're going to then say, we're going to take the whole tithe and all these kids are going to go to public school, uh, we call that out. Calcedon says that is a huge uh, error, and it's going to cost us dearly. The kingdom of God is going to pay an enormous price for what is a misdirection of the tithe. The tithe ought not to be divided in that way. Uh, The kids should not be in public schools, and one reason that they are is that if the church is getting all 10%, uh, 90% of that was supposed to go for Levitical functions, which is the education of the children, uh, which that means it should be supported for homeschooling or Christian schools, and that isn't happening. So the division of the tithe is a big deal. Um, Let's see what we've got here. Thanks so much for encouragement and edifying comments. Would you share some wisdom and how to reach out in humility and wisdom to young Christians about deeper issues of doctrine? By Kevin Amundsen. And I don't see the rest of the quote. It's just missing. I'm sorry to say. But I'll try to answer the part that I can understand. And, and, and Kevin's got a good point there. How do we reach out in humility and wisdom uh, to young Christians? I think uh, it's helpful... And I, and I do want to refer again to that article, The Perpetual Kindergarten, that I wrote, because it synthesizes a lot of input from Matthew Henry, John Owen, and others. Uh, and I was uh, very blatant in saying, I'm, res- I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants. Ah, there we thank you. While building and maintaining relationships with them in a young church plant. So, yeah, you kind of have to do all. It, it, it's a multitasking situation. If people think that what they know is good enough, and they're not on the hook, to understand more than they have, then they stop growing, uh, and they stop dead in their tracks. So what we have to do is encourage them to grow and to build, uh, and that means that they have to see value in everything. See, the modern church tends to compartmentalize life into the uh, 
ministerial, the sacerdotal, if you will, and everything else is the worldly stuff. And that's that's dangerous position because Christ is concerned with all matters, uh, front, back and forth, front and center, east, west, north, west, south. And without moving forward in terms of everything being important to Christ, such that whatever you do, you're going to do with all, all your might, and you're going to do it unto the Lord to glorify Him. Therefore, the priesthood of all believers has to come into play here. And we have to inculcate the, uh, this into uh, the young Christians, because if we don't reach them, then what future does Christian Reconstruction have if the next generation is already uh, out to lunch? So uh, it's important that what, why, are we build, why are we going to plant this church? If we're going to plant this church because we're going to play church, then it's not going to do the full whole counsel of God. We're not going to have the entire scripture being applied. And we have to move in terms of what the uh, Psalm 119 tells us. I've seen an end to all perfection, but thy commandment is exceedingly broad. They need to be appreciative that the word of God applies to everything across the board. And consequently, they are on the hook. And they should be excited about being on the hook. That what they do has meaning, that they can take the word of God, the transformative word of God, into every area and rebuild it to reconcile all things to Christ. You know, in fact, we're ambassadors for Christ, and our ambassadorship includes all things that we're doing uh, from beginning to end, top, top to bottom. I'm going to reiterate that whole notion of the whole totality of creation uh, is a arena for us to apply true dominion. Rushmi said something very interesting in one of his books I have up here on the shelf. He says, <clears throat> there's no dominion in politics because politics doesn't produce anything. It's not productive. All dominion uh, is going to come from productive labor and work and creativity and innovation, but mostly labor. You know, a man diligent in his labors, he shall stand before kings. And you know, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. So in this instance, once we appre appreciate this, then we expand the horizons of the church, not just from doing church, but from being, but to be relevant for a faith for all of life. That magazine title was not chosen just because it was snappy. Maybe it is, but it, because it addresses what we're interested in. So yeah, all of that's important. And you can certainly uh, talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, Kevin, about that question. Let's see, another question came in. Are you excited, as Joe and I are, to see a young generation of serious Christians uh, springing up around the world? Yeah, I would say very excited. I'm seeing exciting things in India, in particular, uh, where folks that had been um, sold out for decades on dispensational thinking have been had seen seed sown from Reconstructionist materials over the years that have now put them in a position to become a large-scale Reconstructionist movement, uh, kind of under the under the radar, if you will, which is fine. You know, sometimes seeds grow where you can't see them, and and it's not a matter of walking by sight anymore. Any of them, is it? If you're post millennialist, you're going to be walking by faith no matter what till the last generations. So yeah, I find I find that very exciting. Also, things happening in Africa that are exciting to me, as well as in China. Uh, in terms of the word of God is not bound; you cannot chain it up. Uh, ironically, certain kinds of theologies do chain up the word of God chain it away from us and say that's the word of God emeritus over there doesn't apply so therefore we can legislate anew which brings us back to the Phariseeism at the first question essentially if the word of God does not apply then you have to legislate your own laws and supplant these things what's happening in these places is a little bit too naive uh, to fall for these sophisticated new theologies that have arisen since 1830s. And consequently, when they receive the Word of God, <clears throat> they see it as world-transforming, and they see it as necessary to bringing all their institutions and all things uh, in subjection to Christ. And we're not so certain about it, because we're saying, oh, the world's a terrible place. America's going to heck in a handbasket, and we have all these terrible things happening in D.C. You're looking at the wrong things. Because what matters is not what happens in the world, it's what God says. You know, if, God, if Job is willing to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, we should be able to say, though the newspapers look bad, yet will I trust God. I mean, how much more important is your life to be slain by God than a newspaper headline? And also, most people forget the fact that uh, Hebrews 12 is always operative. It's a quotation from Haggai 2. 
concerning the fact that God is shaking all things so that the unshakable will remain. That word in the Hebrew, in Hebrews, is a seismos, earthquake, literally. God is uh, shaking all things, and by this we talk about political concussions. Everything is in continual uh, clash mode so that only the things that can uh, survive will stand. It again dovetails with Mark's uh, sermon. The uh, storms came and blew on the house. The ones that were built on the sand didn't make it. They were Great was the fall of it. And so all these things that are supposedly going to stand in the way of the kingdom of God are all going to be laid in ruins because all things will be shaken until only the kingdom of God is left. So anything not founded on the kingdom of God is not going to last. Things founded on the word of God, like these new nations, the, uh, the uh, nascent movements that are moving in these areas, <coughs> They will t stand the test, even if American churches don't, because they're built on the sand. Churches elsewhere will not. Uh, we've gotten very provincial and arrogant in our thinking that America is the be-all and end-all, as if the progress is only westward and that's the end of the story. Way back in the early 1982 or so, Douglas F. Kelly made the comment then, presciently in my view, he said, we th it's possible that new light's going to dawn in Africa, and America might be uh, left behind in the lurch. Uh, due to indolence and spiritual dullness. And sure enough, uh, a lot of that's happening. As bad as things are in Africa, the uh, Christian resurgence there is stupendous. And so uh, the new generations there are exciting. Uh, and I see this also in America, where there are those who are willing to go, uh, for the whole, go to the mat for the whole counsel of God versus a truncated gospel a gospel that can get you into heaven, but essentially that's the limit of it. And that's that's not the gospel. The gospel transforms the entire man. We are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Some atheists have charged me with saying, well, that's mind control. <laughs> of course, they were very interested in mind controlling minds themselves. And they don't understand the liberty that's in Christ. It's uh, foolishness to them, so there's not a lot that we can do about that. Let's see if there's any f more questions here. Right, uh, again, Becky mentions Brazil, Haiti, the Philippines, the South Africa. God is on the move, and he's not, and so therefore you can't just look at what we're looking at here. <coughs> How is my last name pronounced? It's not a lame question, and the answer depends what country you're in. It's a German surname, and in Germany you would say Zellbrede. And in America it's been anglicized to Celebrity. So if you hear someone sell, say cell breed, you know they've never heard it. And it's always helpful to know how to pronounce it. I wonder if that question is going to come up every single time. All right, Russell Treweek joined us. I'll go as long as my voice is going to keep going or our technical director decides to uh, pull the plug on me. I think we've uh, had an interesting Q&A session today. Yeah, yes, you're welcome, madam. And if there are no more questions, which was how Dr. Rushdorny would always close his sessions, he would say, well, if there are no more questions, let us close in prayer. And I've got the note. Oh, a final update on the Kishore project. I will close with that. Thank you, Priscilla. And then we're going to close off. The, we'll be running the final 18th... Uh, article on him in a uh, couple of uh, issues of Faith for All Life to come. And the movie is still in production. There'll be a pre-production rough cut being shown at the Future of Christendom Conference in Reading, Pennsylvania, Friday, um, July 7th. And so that is where we will be. Um, I'll be there to introduce the film and answer questions afterward uh, concerning it. It's been a very exciting process of getting that film done. Of course, what we've done here is drill down into one topic for 17 whole sessions, trying to do it justice, to show how Christian Reconstruction applied to one area can have an enormous impact uh, on human life. For those who say, no, uh, biblical prerogatives and virtues have no place in the modern culture, 
Uh, they're consigning everyone to become walking zombies addicted to methadone and other narcotic substitutes. Now, only in the biblical virtues of sobriety are promoted do we actually get uh, <laughs> do we actually get um, the solution that gives people their lives back. Do we have reconstruction that is life enhancing and bring people back online? You know, lots of times the church goes and works and evangelizes people that would uh, otherwise have been the dregs of society. This certainly was a position in early ancient Rome. What? How could we change things if all these folks that are addicted to uh, these opioids and whatnot could be tr um, migrated out of that into productive Christians who were serious about their faith? What a big trans uh, translation that would be. And so that's kind of why we're moving this project along the way we are. We see tremendous value in it. Uh, and the movie's going to do over the heavy lifting. There'll be a follow-on book. As I mentioned in the Chalcedon Report, uh, the June one, you'll be getting it in your mailboxes pretty soon. Uh, Dr. Rushtuni himself talked, uh, talked about medical issues for 13 uh, sessions, and that formed the book that's currently out there um, about uh, wellness and faith, wellness and health. And so it makes sense for us to follow through with the book, put every, all the, the, all, everything together in one big piece, and uh, release it with the movie. Be in prayer for the movie and uh, for the work that Joaquin Fernandez is doing on it. It's a major production, and it's got a lot of uh, there's a lot of film that's not going to make it into the f movie. That's extremely compelling anyway. You cannot do a 10-hour movie uh, unless you want to ensure its death, <laughs> because no one's going to watch it. So it's a tough call to edit it all together in the most compelling way and get that message out. But we're going to prove uh, proceed with it. So I'm uh, very excited about the, the movie. And for those who are going to be at Reading, Pennsylvania, I'll be seeing you guys there uh, when Chalcedon is on hand for the unveiling of a rough cut of the film, speed of production, not quite finished. Uh, and it's going to be an exciting time. Thank you for all your time. We will do this again next week. Hopefully we won't have so many of those uh, personal questions about what about Christian A, B, or C, name by name. And, uh, oh yeah, I should also mention, thank you, uh, technical manager. Uh, people can donate uh, to help fund the movie. It will be, uh, you know, visit the Calcedon site. And uh, uh, certainly we do need to complete the, the project. Uh, we've underwritten all the principal photography, and that's a good point, good part of it. But we're not done. It, it, it is still more to do. And if you want to come alongside Calcedon, on this project and finish out, see what it really is to complete a Christian Reconstruction uh, project from start to finish and provide the world answers that it doesn't, it's not even aware of, that uh, are so much better than the humanistic ones by a factor of 30, 30 times more lives saved and restored than the humanistic systems. Here's a good place to start. Here's where the rubber hits the road with Reconstruction. It's a good case example because uh, it is such a serious crisis and it is spun out of control because the Christian was taken out of the <laughs> out of the loop because he was too effective. We always say it, sometimes uh, the Christians get in trouble because they're too effective. The state sees it and they want to shut them down. It's not the first time it's happened, it's not the last time that the state will resent that God's people have something to say for their position and the Bible applies better than the... Uh, the humanistic solutions, which reject the law of God and therefore reject the light in favor of the darkness. Chalcedon's here to promote the light and uh, pray for us that we continue to do so. Thank you for your time. We'll see you guys all next week. Thanks for all the questions, even the tough ones. I don't think I shied away from any of them that I can tell. And uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti. We pray that you have been edified by the content that you've heard on this episode. Please visit calcedon.edu for some great resources and reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you in all that you do.